Stardate JD2456543.5 Point five zero 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 zero. Personal log zero zero three. Tonight, Capricornus will pass low across the southern sky. The smallest constellation in the zodiac's longest side is marked by an east-west line, the base of a triangle said to be a portal through which souls passed on their way to heaven. Capricornus has been represented as a hybrid between a goat and fish for over three thousand years. In Roman 130 BCE, the winter solstice took place while the sun was centered in Capricornus. The sun's most southern position is reached at the northern hemisphere's winter solstice. This is called the Tropic of Capricorn. The Tropic, from the Greek tropos or turn, is the line on the earth at which the sun is directly overhead at noon on that solstice. Just a few minutes north of the Tropic of Cancer, in Antofagasta, Chile, lies the Alma Telescope Array in the Atacama Desert. The Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or Alma for short, consists of 66 12 and 7 meter diameter radio telescopes observing at millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. Alma is providing insight on star birth, the formation of the early universe, and detailed imaging of local star and planet formations. Alma is also Portuguese for soul. This week, the 17-day strike at Alma came to an end. Union employees fought for a reduced workload and sought benefits to compensate for the high altitude and isolation they endure. The 194 striking workers were technicians and administrators and did not include scientists, although scientists supported the workers' rights and commented that their demands were fair. Quote, the workers endure very difficult conditions, laboring at an altitude of over 5,000 meters, where oxygen is sparse, temperatures are extremely low, and the wind is fierce, and they have long shifts, according to Ezekiel Triester, professor of astronomy at the University of Concepcion, Chile. The Santiago Times headline remarked that the telescope array had, quote, already solved long-standing mysteries of the universe, end quote. How is it, then, that we are not able to solve simple labor disputes? In retaliation for the strike, Associated Workers University Incorporated, which runs the facility, suspended the contracts of striking workers. It declared the strike to be an illegal operation that, quote, threatened security at the observatory, jeopardized access to electricity and water and other services, and, quote, put the scientific patrimony at risk. What is scientific patrimony? It is the legitimizing of one's work by connecting it to that of one's most credible and respected forebearers, with one's own work as the natural outcome of their historical trajectory. Most importantly, those forebearers are recognized through the terminology as male, and the inheritance passed down through the generations as property. Feminist Grace Paley was considering her legacy before her death in 2007. She was asked what she would like to pass down to future generations, and recognizing that, if she were a man, this would be her patrimony, she took the word to task, there being no female equivalent. She wrote, Patrimony and matrimony do not say what they mean. Patriarchy and matriarchy do. Patrimony, as any reader probably knows, is what you inherit from your father. Matrimony is the state of being in a marriage. Now men live in it, marriage, as well as women, and it is therefore a little joke for men that this word is used about a condition in which women and families have often suffered the strongest patriarchal oppression. Matrimony is not what you inherit from your mother, probably because in history she didn't own much of anything. It's been a long time since we say that matrimony or marriage is women's inheritance. There are probably other words that disregard their etymological roots in order to be transformed into the gender-ridden history of men and women. If marriage and its historic condition have been what women leave to their daughters and sons, what is it that men leave, have left, and continue to leave, she asks. Although I appreciate Paley's final question, the answer is obvious, and as so, not that interesting. How then might we shape a scientific matrilineal body? How might the legitimation of scientific work be based in the historic conditions of women's lives? How does our oppression lend credibility to our application of the scientific process? Feminism advocates for an intersectional analysis where science promotes an academy divided into distinct silos of scholarship and knowledge. 
how can these perpendicular ways of looking be reconciled? Perhaps Donna Haraway, in her Cyborg Manifesto, Science, Technology, and Socialist Feminism in the Late 20th Century, suggests that, when she writes, The cyborg is a creature in a post-gender world. It has no truck with bisexuality, pre symbiosis, unalienated labor, or other seductions to organic wholeness through a final appropriation of all the powers of the parts into a higher unity. In a sense, the cyborg has no origin story in the Western sense, a final irony since the cyborg is also the awful apocalyptic telos of the West, as escalating dominations of abstract individuation, an ultimate self untied at last from all dependency, a man in space. An origin story in the Western, humanist sense depends on the myth of original unity, fullness, bliss and terror represented by the phallic mother from whom all humans must separate, the task of individual development and of history, the twin potent myths inscribed most powerfully for us in psychoanalysis and Marxism. Hilary Klein has argued that both Marxism and psychoanalysis, in their concepts of labor and of individuation and gender formation, depend on the plot of original unity out of which difference must be produced and enlisted in a drama of escalating domination of woman nature. The cyborg skips the step of original unity, of identification with nature in the Western sense. This is its legitimate promise that might lead to subversion of its teleology as Star Wars. The cyborg is resolutely committed to partiality, irony, intimacy, and perversity. It is oppositional, utopian, and completely without innocence. No longer structured by the polarity of public and private, the cyborg defines a technological poles based partly on a revolution of social relations in the oikos, the household. Nature and culture are reworked. The one can no longer be the resource for appropriation or incorporation by the other. The relationships for forming holes from parts, including those of polarity and hierarchical domination, are at issue in the cyborg world. Unlike the hopes of Frankenstein's monster, the cyborg does not expect its father to save it through a restoration of the garden, that is, through the fabrication of a heterosexual mate, through its completion in a finished whole, a city and cosmos. The cyborg does not dream of community on the model of the organic family, this time without the Oedipal project. The cyborg would not recognize the Garden of Eden, it is not made of mud and cannot dream of returning to dust. Perhaps that is why I want to see if cyborgs can subvert the apocalypse of returning to nuclear dust in the manic compulsion to name the enemy. Cyborgs are not reverent, they do not remember the cosmos. They are wary of holism, but needy for connection they seem to have a natural feel for united front politics, but without the vanguard party. The main trouble with cyborgs, of course, is that they are the illegitimate offspring of militarism and patriarchal capitalism, not to mention state socialism. But illegitimate offspring are often exceedingly unfaithful to their origins. Their fathers, after all, are an essential. Returning to Alma and its search for the origins of the universe, the language surrounding its discoveries may be problematic but curiously so. One article is titled, Boundless Starbirth. Another describes the small fuzzy patch of light below the three stars of Orion's belt as a spectacular stellar nursery, a complex of thousands of newborn stars. Why do we talk of birth rather than formation? Why adopt the language of the oikos to describe the cosmos? Is this a useful metaphor or a dangerous appropriation? If it is framed by our understanding of space as having been shaped by a scientific patrimony, whose child is this? A stunning discovery was made recently by astronomers at Chalmers University in Sweden. Using Alma's smaller predecessor at the La Silla Observatory in Chile to observe the Rosetta Nebula, scientists found tiny dark clouds in space that proposed the possibility that some free-floating planets formed on their own. They have no parent star. Born free, the research declares. 
Thus, while we may be still subject to the inheritance of a scientific body of knowledge shaped by capitalist patriarchy, which can only appropriate the language of the feminine sphere in its own exploitative self-service rather than intersect in meaningful ways, there are still realms of the universe that defy the logic of their explorers, reflecting instead the cyborg sensibility, if only an ironic political myth, of a truly immaculate conception.